episode 15 of The Witching Hour. I am Perry Nemiroff, and I'm going to be sitting here chugging water the entire show so I don't cough into the microphone, but yeah. Haley Fouch is super healthy, and she's here with me as well. <laughs> Hi, guys. It's my turn not to cough into we the mic. We switch spots. Yeah. I feel like this cold that I have, though, is a well-earned cold yeah. because I'm convinced that I got it. I mean, I don't specifically know where I got it, <laughs> but it likely was from either Halloween Horror Nights, which I had a lot of fun at, but mm-hmm. like big crowds with people breathing in your face. Then we went to the John Carpenter concert on Halloween night, more big crowds with people breathing in your face. So yeah. I don't know. I feel like it came from one of the two events, but I had a blast at both. So you earned I'll it. take it. All I'll right. take it. That's very positive of you. Yeah. I try I mean, between getting a cold and losing my credit card at the Carpenter concert, <laughs> the fact that I could still feel positive about it. <laughs> It was all worth it, right? It was. It was. Uh, what do you think of seeing John Carpenter in action on stage? It was so much fun. He is so cute and just a little rocking old man. I love him so much. <laughs> Learned some pretty sweet dance moves because he does this like look right, look left, yeah, look center thing. I was really into. <laughs> and he's just like rocking these sunglasses yeah. too. He looks so badass. He also looks truly happy up there absolutely like you just you get that feeling like he's in the zone when he's performing like that and i don't know given all the the stuff we were saying about him during our uh carpenter episode and also with what he says in interviews where it's like i'll do it for the money yeah (laughs) it's like you could just see that he means it when he says his heart lies in the music right now i i feel it i felt it in the room that night And the crowd loves it, too. Oh, my God. That crowd was eating it up. The setup was really cool, too. I have a a video of the full Halloween piece that they did. It was really great. They took the Halloween 2018 score, and then it bled so perfectly into the OG 78 score. And it's just, you couldn't be standing there and be a Halloween fan and not get goosebumps in that moment. But I have the full set on my Instagram if you want to hear that and see what it looked like. But they had... Carpenter and the band in between all these screens Mm -hmm. and the screens were all playing the movies and it was just such a nice touch. It was really fun and I wish if I had one complaint I was surprised they only played Halloween one time on Halloween night. Yeah. They they just did the one bit but it was a beautiful bit. It was. And I loved hearing all the other films as well. You know of course I like I started to run off to get a drink and then they started (laughs) up um Big Trouble in Little China, and then he and came just right back. Full U turned it and ran right. That was back. a great piece too. That played oh. really well in the room. So did they live? A yes. lot of people really lit up when that one kicked oh, in. People love that movie. Yeah, yeah. I don't blame them. It was uh, pretty much the the most I think perfect way to spend Halloween. I really can't think of a single better thing to do than to be in that room on Halloween night. It was really great. I don't, you know, this was my first year in a long time not going up to Portland, so that was yeah, pretty yeah. painful for me. But this was the best, like, anesthetic to help me get through that pain. Yeah. It was Uh, so good. I don't really go on any uh, trips or anything during Halloween. I feel like most of the time it's like party on the weekends. And then if it falls during the work week, I am sitting at home. And I'll hand out candy. Mm -hmm. Like, especially living in an apartment complex, you would think that you don't trick or treat there. But there are kids. It's like you just need to send them a sign by putting a little piece of decoration on your door. Yeah. This year, though, I was the asshole who put a piece of decoration on their door and never left a bowl of candy out. Oh, no. Yeah, I felt really bad, but well, we were already on our way, so I couldn't turn back. If it makes you feel any better, um, I was there in your complex because I have another friend who lives there, and I saw like multiple doors that still had candy outside of them, so I don't think it was like booming. Wait, wait, when? Uh, when was this? Like recent, like after Halloween? Yeah, after Halloween. I, I had a lovely Tootsie Roll the other night. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it was Friday, Friday night. I feel like I, you should have like given me this information and I should have been like the <laughs> asshole who collected all the candy right. after. Uh, I'm also the kind of person who leaves, like, you know, my, my Halloween decoration. It's this really weird, like skeleton with a pumpkin head that yeah. I bought at like a CBS three years ago. And I put it up and I, I don't know, he's just like my little buddy that guards my door. So I leave him up year round. I love it. Hey, Halloween is year round if you keep it in your heart. It, it is. Did you dress up any of the pets? No, we didn't. Um, 
I have like one little outfit for Kitty, but it's it's more for me, and it's just for like two seconds, and then I feel guilty. I mean, aren't all of the pet costumes really just for the well, owners? Well, that's true. Yeah, they're definitely not for the animals. Do, I, Dewey's a uh, Bader Ginsburg oh. costume is at at the top of my all time pet Halloween costume. It was list. beautiful. Uh, it was it was quite nice. And then Focus Beechers, who's releasing on the basis of sex, they shared it too. So oh, I, that's I was great. mighty proud. <laughs> uh, it was so cute. I did. You know, I, I always take advantage of the post Halloween sales at like Party City or, or Spirit. Yeah. And I, I did buy a couple little pet costumes for next year at, oh, a, God. at a discounted rate. Ah, I should probably do that. I'm going to turn Kitty into a sushi. It really does. Oh, that's a good <laughs> one. It's cute, right? It does break my heart a little that, I mean, Halloween isn't even over for an hour, and I also and I'm already like flooded with my inbox. Like, oh, it's time to start thinking about Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yeah. Like, all of this is on sale now. Bye, bye, bye. And I'm like, guys, come on, let me just like sit with Halloween for a little bit, and then. But I don't know. It's the nature it of that business. It is, and it, it's kind of sad. But I also really love Christmas. As do I. <laughs> uh, my mom and I over the weekend were cooking up a storm. And she was like, can I put on Christmas music? And we did. We listened to Christmas music for hours while we cooked. And we were like, you know what? 2018 has really sucked. We deserve two months of Christmas. I guarantee you when I go home for Thanksgiving and I'm in the car with my parents, they'll be playing whatever the Sirius XM Christmas music uh-huh. station is. And <laughs> I don't know. I'll be fine with it. I feel like I credit uh, Nightmare Before Christmas for my joint love of Christmas yes. and uh, and Halloween. Absolutely. Even though I'm, I'm Jewish and I don't celebrate Christmas really. It's such a culturally dominant it is, thing. It is. And my parents were always super cool with just like, I don't know, em- embrace everything. Yeah. Like celebrate whatever you love just because you want to celebrate feel good things. That's great. And I'm also like an obsessive gift giver. I Aww. love buying people gifts <laughs> That's so, so cute. much. Hanukkah this year is at the very beginning of December. So it's like bye, bye, bye right now. Mm-hmm. So I'm prepared. And just doing all the shopping is already getting me all crazy. I love Ow. it. That's so on brand. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of a problem. I might go overboard some years, but better hey, for those you know those receiving. That is one of the best ways to go overboard. That is very true. Yeah. Thank you for making me feel better about myself. I'm always here for that. <laughs> um, we are about to brighten your day right now because <laughs> this episode of The Witching Hour is devoted to, I would say... One of my favorite shows on TV right now, and I think I'm also going to go as far to say one of my favorite TV shows ever. It's a show that is four for four in seasons right now, Mm -hmm. and it's freaking brilliant, and I can't talk about it enough. You've probably heard me say this before, but go watch Channel Zero. Go watch it, guys. If you have not watched Channel Zero yet, one, have you heard anything I said? (laughs) And two, what are you watching? Like, what could you possibly be watching that's better than this, especially if you are a genre fan? This show... Is just, I just want to like sing its praises a little bit before we dig into Mm -hmm. season four because we are going to talk about season four, The Dream Door, right now. And we're going full spoiler. We watched all six episodes. We're going to really dig into it. But just in case you are new to Channel Zero, I can't recommend it enough. It is a series that's available on sci fi, and there's four seasons now, and it's an anthology series, so you can jump in wherever you want. And each season of the show is based on a different creepy pasta. Mm-hmm. And in case you don't know what creepy pasta is, a, an example of a creepy pasta is Slenderman. Mm-hmm. It's a legend that's born online and passed around, and maybe it morphs over time as people add to it. But this show. This show basically embodies, I think, the idea of creepypasta. And in particular, I think the dream door felt like it more so than ever to me, where it starts as one legend, but it ends in such a different place that it almost feels like the story is morphing as you go along. Mm -hmm. And it is just filled with unexpected twists and turns and good scares. All these scares, though, are so character-driven, and that's why these stories stick with you. Yeah, they're... The creator, Nick Antosca, he's really got a knack for spinning out beautiful stories outside of these root sort of internet myths. And really, it's like every season, I feel like it's a, it's the first episode where he, he does almost the whole creepypasta. Mm-hmm. And then this wonderful story comes out of it and he builds that world. And it, it's such an exciting, each one is such an exciting world to explore with different rules and a different visuals iconography yeah 
I, I love it, and I, I support everything you just said. Do you have a favorite season I of Channel Zero? I, it's like a, I, yeah, it's a, a big question. It's hard. It's a big question also because I haven't revisited Candle Cove, and yeah. for some reason I feel like the other three are in such close proximity that I feel more confident in my rankings of those. But mm -hmm. even when I'm ranking them, like I truly, to my core, love all four of them. Yeah. I still think No End House is my favorite. There was something about that whole concept and and also what that what that does to the main character's mind in particular with tapping into all these these real issues that she's going through that I thought was just done so beautifully and actually more than just the main character for that matter. But I really loved that idea and I loved how it, it kind of subverted my expectations where like it, it came to a point where it could have ended, but then it doesn't, yeah. and it gets really deep and interesting. And I just give them all the credit in the world for that season. But again, I loved Butcher's Block, and I loved Candle Cove as well. Yeah, I don't. I feel like this sounds like a cheap and cheating answer, but I really think that my favorite season of Channel Zero is whichever one I'm watching right now. And like, I, I understand that it's very hard to choose. They're all, they all feel in the same world, but very different. I guess Candle Cove, although I, I think it's it's excellent, it does feel like a show finding its feet a little bit. So mm -hmm. the the subsequent three feel a little tighter to me. Yeah. But I really, whatever one I'm watching, I'm like, man, this is just fantastic. Yeah. I mean, really, again, I can't recommend it enough. And feel free to start wherever you want. It yeah. does, that's the beauty of the show is it doesn't matter. If you feel like you want, you know, a certain type of horror and the description of Butcher's Block piques your interest right now, start there, then go to Candle Cove, whatever order you want. These are all stories well worth experiencing in any order. And oh, I hope they make more. I do too. I it's really like, hope they make you more. You know, they reached the end of the current contract they're I know. on, so it's up in the air. I'm a little a little panicked by that Me idea. Me too. But, but I'm I'm curious. I I don't know if it was a success. Haley, <laughs> goodness. Um, but it'll be know. my turn eventually for one of those. <laughs> they uh, they changed up their release strategy this this time around mm -hmm. and released them one episode a night leading up to Halloween and yeah. then release them all immediately on VOD, which I think is so smart. Did they put them all on Shudder? Not It's just yet. the first three seasons that are available on Shudder, yeah. right? Yeah, right. but I've heard it. I think it's going to be there sooner than yeah. later. Um, they put them all on the Sci-Fi app, I believe. Okay. Yeah, and um, I think that's so smart because... It is a really, really great show, but it's not like well known enough to really be appointment TV for a lot mm -hmm. of people. So I, I think I've always watched them in a binge watch because I get screeners. I'm almost the same way. I think the only time I didn't do that was like portions of a season. Like I didn't yeah. do that with some of Butcher's Block because I was trying to keep up with it. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it's just like, I don't, I don't know. Like I tried to spread it out and then it just piled up and I burned through them. Also, there's... I feel like there's a very bingeable quality to it in that many of the episodes end on cliffhangers, not necessarily yeah. manipulative cliffhangers that are like, let me dangle this carrot in front of you so you come to our next episode. Mm -hmm. But I mean, just a, a very well-earned moment that leaves you with the need to click next instead of yes. shutting off whatever you're watching it on. It does feel like, I mean, Netflix maybe has the more, like people are weary of their, yeah. their form of ending shows like that. But it does feel ex especially bingeable for its ending qualities mm -hmm. in each episode. All right. Should we just do it? Are we going to cut it off here and go into spoilers? Go spoilers. Go spoilers. Yeah. All right. So now is the time. I hope that for anybody out there who has not seen any Channel Zero, you got the hint. You're going to go check it out and then come back and revisit this episode with us. But right now, we're jumping into Channel 4 Season 4, the Dream Door spoilers, all six episodes. We are going for it. Okay. I'm going to start this off with a very simple statement. Okay. I heart Pretzel Jack. I love Pretzel Jack. I mean, <laughs> I love Pretzel Jack a little too much. I know. I want to manifest a little door in the wall and have exactly <laughs> Pretzel Jack pop out. I want to have a werewolf oh. cat pop out. That was awesome. That was awesome, too. But I, I don't know. It was something about Pretzel Jack and his journey. <laughs> He's amazing. Through. It's like, I want him to be like my bodyguard now. Yeah. And oh, what what a cool, cool design. That is easily one of the best uh, 
I guess I can call them a monster because they pretty much dubbed them monsters that come out of the door. That is one of the best, like, monster slasher villain characters I've seen in a long time. I'm talking about completely original ones. Pretzel Jack is at the top of my favorite list. Agreed completely. I think he is... Such an extraordinary creation, and I think it's really impressive that we've got this, you know, like homicidal clown in the age of it being popular. And, you know, American Horror Story did homicidal clowns Mm -hmm. last season. And this one's totally different. And and just what a performance by... um, he calls Troy James. Tw- Twisty Troy, yeah. Tr- Twisty Troy. Yeah, Troy James. He's, oh, uh, wow. You know, what he can do with his, his physicality is unmatched. It, it's, like, mind-blowing. Yeah. I, and just the pairing of the movement of his body yeah. with certain sound effects, too. Like, you could, you could feel things in his body, like, <laughs> twisting and turning. It was just so, so well done. And the design of his face is really interesting because it is truly, truly horrifying. Until it's not. Until it's kind of adorable. It's like a really weird thing to kind of juggle in your brain, yeah. too, because he, he's so scary for the first three episodes. And then when he kind of does his little switch, it's like there's there's elements of his uh, of his design that still look like creepy and, and like almost like bloody and raw. Yeah. Like burn like almost like burn marks yeah, yeah. on them. And they're very unpleasant to look at. But all you want to do is give the guy a hug. <laughs> I oh. want one of his over-the-head hugs. I, I'm just... I almost don't have the words for how satisfied I was at the end of this season. It's and fantastic It's ending. just like you go into it episode one when you first meet the two of them. And I think Brandon Scott, again, killed it. He mm-hmm. was also in uh, Butcher's Block. He plays Luke. And then... Um, we also had Maria Sten, who yes. plays Jillian, and they're obviously our main couple here. And, I mean, within minutes of the two of them being on screen, their chemistry just felt palpable to me. And I'm like, I'm going to like you, too. I like them. I like that this, uh, I don't know, the season was sexy. Yeah. Like, I would say that. kind of different. And it's it's fun to see a relationship on screen that is, like, sexual and satisfying mm-hmm. for them in a very passionate way and yes they have great chemistry it's it's a love story which is weird for channel zero yeah and it's it's really nice there's something uh, about her in particular mm-hmm. that feels very like natural and charismatic on screen and not to discount his performance at all i think it's just because i was he familiar. doesn't have as much to do either i was also just familiar with him yeah. from before and she was i've never seen her in anything or at least anything that i really remember well yeah. so seeing her in a lead role in this show there's i don't know there's just something about her face her voice her physicality that really pops and she also feels like a very capable hero to root for Mm -hmm. it's like even though she had no clue what was going on and eventually becomes like highly uh manipulated by the neighbor i really thought that if anybody could figure out a way out of this situation and kind of pull it together and control pretzel jack like Mm -hmm. she could do it and i liked having someone that i really wanted to root for like that I like her a lot. She's going to be in the uh, the new Swamp Thing show. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, that's very exciting. I like that these these horror filmmakers have her eye on her. You know, James Wan producing that. Mm-hmm. Um, I really appreciate... Uh, okay, so I want to talk about The Neighbor. I can, yeah. Okay. All right, I'm curious, curious to hear what, what you did think you first. What did you just want to say? No, 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 go for it. Go for it. That character becomes something kind of goofy almost at a certain point like so archly villainous okay but i really appreciate the performance of that actor who kept me on board through Steven all of it Steven Robertson as Ian who i was not very familiar with no, either me neither um uh, like, I could tell immediately, I was like, this neighbor's fucked up. Like, this is weird. Don't trust that guy. But he made me want to. Like, want to be his buddy. Yeah. It, it, that's a hard hard trick to pull off. I wouldn't say I was completely surprised when it was revealed that he, you know, had a little agenda there. Yeah. But I, I do think that he, he earned some of my trust at the beginning. Like, it was an immediate red flag when they're like, a door. He's like, a door? Like, what do you mean a door? <laughs> and then they get to talking, and he's just so overly friendly with yes. her and, like, wants to train her and all that nonsense. But, you know, when you have a moment like like the pool scene and you realize that she can't do that like she needs someone's help and he's there for her and Mm -hmm. i mean 
I found it really surprising how quickly I forgot about the coincidence of someone living across the street that happened to have the same ability because <laughs> I wanted her to be safe so badly and I wanted them to mend their relationship so badly that I'm like, go to this guy who has all the answers no matter what. Even though I'm looking at his face, I'm like, you a creep guy. Like he, <laughs> You are not to be trusted, he, young man. <laughs> but he, there's, some, there's something about him yeah. and like his outfit and everything that just like branded creep. Absolutely, from the very beginning. I think he intentionally was supposed to be pretty uh, creepy. I liked when he got like really kooky, though. Yeah, he got real, real mustache twirly, super villainy. Like, yeah, I mean, definitely in the in the abandoned complex at the end. I think yes. that's where it was at its peak. I was really digging it towards, you know, when he kills the two cops. Yeah, that's the performance from him. <laughs> I feel, I feel like that that kind of towed the line between like a little big, but mm -hmm. also super sinister and scary. And I love to be able to see like the physical ramifications of what they're capable of doing. And it's just like every single time he ate, oh my God, <laughs> oh my God. when he sat there eating those burgers, yes. holy shit, <laughs> that's a lot of burger. He went for it. Oh, he really did. Yeah. I wonder how many times they had to shoot that. I just want to know how many burgers <laughs> he really <laughs> ate. I, I really did. I enjoyed him and uh, I think I think what I'm trying, what I'm coming down to and trying to say is he brings a bit of camp to it. Yeah. Which uh, I feel like the other two actors are playing it very straight. And he, he brings just a bit of camp to the proceedings that I find very fun. He definitely did that. Yeah. He did that quite well. Um, but yeah, that that whole, like the whole progression of what we got. Because like when I finished it, I finished it last night as we're recording right now, but when I finished it, I caught myself just going back to the, the very beginning and I guess what is kind of the inciting incident where he calls up to her and he's like, was there a door down here? Yeah. And just, just how simple it started and just where my mind was at in that moment trying to figure out what exactly is going on here and where it ended up, which is completely different than anything I could have imagined. Because mm -hmm. you see that door and you think... You know, I guess my mind automatically went to something like No End House, and I was influenced by that. Like, oh, it's it's like it's a house that appears somewhere. It's a door that just appears somewhere. But the fact that the appearance of the door and what's inside the door is so strongly rooted to who someone is and their past and their yeah. experiences, that's what makes everything happen. As crazy and zany as some of the situations might be and terrifying, but that that's what makes it matter. And I think that's what Channel Zero does better than a lot of other horror content out there where actually and not not Hill House too. I think Hill House does this really well too. But where it's not scaring for the sake of scaring, it's an earned scare, it's a necessary scare for the sake of the story progressing and for the character's journey progressing. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but to expand upon it, like that where he's like, well, there's, there was ever a door here and you're wondering what's inside there. Really, the whole creepypasta that precedes it ends as soon as the man runs out of the room. Mm -hmm. That's the end of the story. And then, so all this other character work and backstory and making it about her and not just some random door in your house that came out of nowhere was beautiful and really, really well thought out. And even though it's an adaptation of sorts, that is an original story totally. right there. Yes, God, absolutely. They're, they're, they make such good original. See, this is why I'm so, I was so hard on Slender Man because there's no excuse. It had the model that Channel Zero laid out right. for them three times over, maybe two times over when they actually went into production or whatnot. But there's no excuse to be lazy with it because that's the whole point of creepypasta is to encourage creativity right. and expansion and growth and when you just you just stop dead at the idea of oh like a like a tall slender man and you don't add anything like especially given everything else going around going on around that particular creepy pasta but when you don't make any kind of creative effort to dig a little deeper and make something more out of it like, what was the point in doing it in the first place then no i well money but for sony isn't that always the answer jobs. yeah uh it was not good. I have nothing good to say about that movie. Mm -mm. Uh, and yeah, I think we talked about this a little bit when we did our review episode for it, but just like Channel Zero shames you. It I know. shames you by its very existence. Well, 
All right, I'm going to get shit for this, but I'm going to say it because Walking Dead is on everybody's brains right now. Yeah. But the conversation we just had um, out in the office before starting this was someone made a joke about the Walking Dead, you know, rinse, washing, repeating its storylines every single totally. episode. And and I started to think about it because I'm going to catch up to get to the Big Rick moment, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um but then the thought of doing that when I could be experiencing something as creative as Channel Zero, like it's sad. It's like Walking Dead is the antithesis of Channel Zero. Channel Zero gets more and more creative every season, never does anything twice. Mm -hmm. And here's Walking Dead that gets so many more viewers and just, well, I mean, viewers are declining. But, you know, it still gets a whole lot of viewers. That's why popular. they're making the movies. Yeah. But, uh you know, you have that getting all the attention, and then you have quality like this that needs more eyeballs. And I just, I, if I could grab all these heads and like turn it towards a Channel Zero screen, I would. They don't want that though. I mean, not not to sum up yeah. like, millions of people. I know, I know. But the 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 people I know who still really faithfully watch The Walking Dead, like my mother, who I adore. So this is not an insult okay. to anybody. She really wants the repetition kind of. She, it's like oh. a. It's like a soap opera almost to her, you know? It's like an easy story to follow along once a week, and she's hugely huh. invested in the characters and everything, but she's not. she doesn't show up to The Walking Dead to think really hard. She just wants her stories. I get it. I think I can I can understand and relate more on the the character investment level, yeah. especially when you're talking a show that's been on for so many years. And I have been watching from the beginning, and I'll never fall off to the point where I'm just going to stop because I'm so invested. I need to know how their journeys end. But I can't I can't understand uh, the idea of just wanting something like sit back, relax, like easy easy digestible material to the point of it being the same thing all the time. I tell you, I find it incredibly grating. And I know there are viewers yeah. that aren't like my mother yeah, who yeah. also do. I'm not, again, not trying to say millions of people are the same person. But she really doesn't care. <laughs> like, she just wants to see her no. stories with the characters that she loves. Honestly, good for her. Yeah. You know, if, if anybody out there ever finds any enjoyment in any piece of entertainment, I applaud it, whether yeah. I like it or not, because that's what it's all there for. It's all there to you know, either make you happy or move you or touch you in some way, shape or form. And if it accomplishes that, even if it doesn't accomplish it for the majority out there, good on you. I mean, I think it's a, it's a recurring theme in horror that you know, we wish Slender Man made a decent amount of money. Do I wish all those people had gone out to see Suspiria this weekend instead? Absolutely. But, you know, there is something to be said, and this is why studios and networks continue to do it, to mm -hmm. appealing to sort of the lowest common denominator and making something that's, that's less distinct but more accessible. Yeah, Suspiria didn't really it did not keep it up off. very well. No. It's got a per theater average of just above three thousand. Yeah. Um, you know, at least it'll pop up on Amazon though. Yeah, I'm I want it to make money though because I desperately want Luca to make sequels. <laughs> I I think I desperately want it just because I'm so curious where he would take it from here. I would watch so The Walking Dead has been around for 10 years. I would watch 10 years of Suspiria <laughs> Universe any day. Well, I would watch 10 years of uh, Channel hopefully, Zero. Hopefully, hopefully. Um, E.L. Katz, though, really crushed it. I'm a big fan of his from Cheap Thrills. Yes. I actually think it might still be on Netflix. If you haven't seen his movie Cheap Thrills, it is a lot of brutal, nasty fun. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the only way I could kind of describe something like that. But he really just ran with it here. Mm -hmm. Like, he... The, again, another broad Channel Zero statement, but you could feel the uh, the director getting creative control over their visuals because there are so many specific camera moves and framing choices, and you could just feel all the passion and energy that is going into every single frame of it where you are, you, you are required, this is actually very active viewing, you are required to think about what every single person is saying, where yeah. any other character could be at any given moment. And there's certain visual choices that he makes here that I, I wasn't sure if they were going to play well time and time again, but they turned out to really have a big payoff. And the one in particular I'm talking about is when they conjure a door and the camera flips. Uh -huh. Also because when it starts to not work at the end and almost like stop dead in its tracks, then when it winds up going all the way around, mm. you feel it even more. Yeah, it's 
especially towards the end, and I don't know if this was an intentional influence in any capacity, but I felt like a lot of Lucio Fulci and his visuals and mm. camera movements, especially with the w- the crayon kids or whatever yeah, yeah, they're yeah. called. I felt that all felt very very folky to me. Those were nasty. Yeah. I loved that design. As did I. The design uh, of the last room too, with all the doors, was yeah, just great. Stu- like well, if I could kinda... just have a poster of that blown up, yeah. I would take it. That's the other thing. Oh, they really should make some mondo art of that or something. Well, you know what they should make mondo art of of every single title shot, yeah. title uh, title card shot. Uh-huh. Like they always put the Channel Zero Dream Door title card on the most beautiful frame That's in the episode. True. The other thing I wanted to compliment, though, as far as the look of the series is this, I think, is, well, okay, so Butcher's Block used red very yes. vividly, but I think this is the most colorful season Oh, yet, absolutely. And it looks fantastic. It, it's really, it's a nice, different spin on it, because, like, if you look back at Candle Cove and even No End House to an extent, they're more grayish Yeah, I was going to say, series. yeah. This is very vibrant and punchy, and it looks good, which is... I think maybe harder to pull off vibrant and punchy yeah. with a lower budget. There was something about the the vibrancy of it that you know connected to the crayon kids that connected to their their childhood yeah. with disability. I mean that that is what this is to me. It's basically adults manifesting their childhood imaginary friends or dreams mm-hmm. or anything and pulling them out of a, a tiny door minus okay wait wait minus you, okay. you know where I'm going <laughs> yeah. I was two seconds away from texting you the other night but I felt <laughs> like such shit that I couldn't get up oh, and get my no. phone but holy shit when she opened the door and there was like a little like baby something or other in there baby. <sighs> so are you are you pro this oh, or my god yeah I think I have to be pro this, <laughs> given my extreme response. To, I mean, that was like a, one of the ultimate holy shit moments of the entire series for of the entire. Uh, yeah, actually, the, the entire season and the entire series yeah. for me. And it was a moment that made so much sense. Sure. I mean, why wouldn't that happen if she has those abilities? She doesn't have the full ability to control it. Yeah. And in that moment, that's what she's thinking about. And all that energy is radiating out from her. Yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense. She would pop the door open and that's what would be in there. <laughs> There's your little sewed up baby. <laughs> oh, and my I, God. I, I, for me, I feel like someone should count how many times I've said like, oh, my oh God, my God. Oh, in this episode. It was a it was a swing that didn't fully work for me. It was one of the few things in the season that I was like, I don't know, guys. But the reason the idea is great, I think it comes down to execution and that there wasn't room to do it well in the story. It okay. just feels like a side diversion that doesn't really mean anything. Mm-hmm. And it they already had a lot to do at that point, so I wasn't very fulfilled. But it wasn't interesting and well executed idea in the shocking moment that's for sure i just felt like it was you know it was like 10 minutes of like leave me alone i want to be with my baby and then it doesn't really mean anything Uh, i mean i guess when you say it i think it it probably could have used an additional beat after the baby thing passes away to see her kind of process it and be able to nudge herself in the other direction it is it does make an impact though Ooh, that and the dogs Dog. Oh my God, those dogs! There, I said it again. Oh my God, oh my those dogs. God! <laughs> I said it again. Um, yeah, the dogs got me. The dogs got me, and good. that was a nice reveal too. Yeah, because I I had almost completely forgotten about the possibility yeah. of the dog when they find it in the basement in episode one of where that could have come from, and the idea of Ian having been the one to plant it there. It's it's so it's so eerie and manipulative. Yeah, it is. I had. I had not forgotten about it, but I just had assumed it was her. So that was a very, yeah. very good reveal. And that worked a lot better for me than the weird baby. It's also so smart. I mean, now thinking back to episode one, just having them take so much time to get that door open. Oh, dude, if you go back and rewatch. So I, I went back and rewatched the first two. Yeah. There are so many direct hints to everything that's about to happen. Like, it's all in the dialogue. It's really? kind of crazy. I should have taken notes on the specifics. But yeah, there's. Oh, I can't wait to rewatch this now. wild foreshadowing in the first two episodes. It's it's really tight writing. And I need to check so that out. So talking about the writing, and I don't want to detour too far, but I'm really excited because Nick Antosca is working on the new Child's yes. Play series. Yay! I'll take I'll take anything that Nick Antosca touches at this point. Yeah. Like I have so much faith. I mean, really, just 
like creative abilities that are out of control. Yeah. When you I, when you look at all four of these seasons like yeah. side by side and think that you know it was spearheaded by one brain mm-hmm. in a way. I mean, obviously a lot of other people worked on this, but I'm still just astounded. It's very impressive, and it's like you said, they are. He's pulling from stories that weren't his originally, but building an entire original mm-hmm. story out of them. Yeah, it's I and I I I love 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 Chucky, so I am so excited. To you said see he's his... working on the series, series, so not the movie. Negative. This is another reason for me to hate on that movie. <laughs> I don't like using the H word, but yeah. I just don't want that movie. You know, I just want prove them to yourself continue. to me. Child's Play movie. Yeah. That's what I'll say. All right, yeah. I'm not on board with the idea, but. Prove yourself. I'll be mildly open-minded and yeah. leave it at that. I'll leave a little crack in my door for like them Aubrey to Plaza. maybe surprise me. Yeah, I like Aubrey Plaza too. And, you know, as the project comes together, there are certainly some promising pieces there. It's just... We'll see. There's we'll something see. else in that franchise <laughs> I like that still exists. Yeah. Um, the one thing in this that I got hung up on that didn't entire not not necessarily didn't work for me because I think it works really well in driving the story forward and being there to make certain things happen, but I never believed that he would do it is Tom's affair. Oh. Well. I wouldn't I wouldn't have minded a couple of extra moments or not, I don't want to use the word explanation, but I wanted to feel a little more of his pull to her so was it that he had an affair or was it that he had been with her before they had slept together and they had slept together and she had a baby and he did the math and he thought that baby was his and it was i mean i guess affair isn't right i mean it's more of a secret but it is kind of an affair well not he cheated on her no he said that they hooked up before he was ever with her, before they were married. It was just that he kept just the kid. Just that he had a the secret. kid. Which, given her backstory, is just as bad. Like, her whole thing was she was traumatized by her father hiding a secret yeah, family. Yeah, but they were still together then. Like, he still technically cheated on her. I don't think so. Maybe I'm reading it wrong, but oh. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was supposed to be May- that he didn't. No, it's it's possible. I might be. Blo- I know they were friends for a very long time. Yeah. I don't know the specific span of of dating to marriage to whatever, but I mean that that was a very small kid, and they were already was. married in the show. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm getting my timelines wrong, but. I definitely read it that they, it, he did not cheat on her, but he did keep a secret family from her. Yeah. Well, that that was. Yeah. Or at least in his mind, he right, kept exactly. a secret family from Which her. Which is really all that matters when it comes to that sort of thing. I mean, it would have been nice if the lady would huh. have just been like, let me blood test my child. And I know, right like, off the bat, yeah. especially if she's accusing him of stalking she's, her. Right, I'm going to call like, the why cops don't you on just, you. Why don't you just end it right now? Yeah. Especially if you suspect that it might not even be his. Yeah, and she did cheat on her husband. I yes. do not believe that he actually cheated. Huh. I must have just like maybe I not, could, not I paid attention wrong. to a line of dialogue. <laughs> no, it's totally possible. I mean, I did watch uh, the large majority of the show in a NyQuil haze, so it, <laughs> it could have happened. Um, but yeah, that would probably alleviate the one thing that was kind of like I, I got yeah. very hung up on is it didn't seem so in character for him to go out of his way to sleep with yeah. someone else when they were so like their love for each other felt so real well, to like me. Like I said, they're very passionate. Yeah. They're sexually satisfied people with each other. Mm-hmm. But people cheat on each other for all kinds of reasons, yeah. and I believe anybody will well, do anything to anyone. Which is also something that they kind of uh, further try to establish. Just not even necessarily the idea of cheating, but the idea of maybe doing things that would uh, that would rub your significant other the wrong way. Like even even the things with her and her past. This, and this is another reason why I love Channel Zero overall because they they tie in things from characters' past so well. The stuff with her father and her mm-hmm. father leaving, that's also why the Ian payoff, I thought, worked yes. especially well. Because she's, li- she's like that. She is the way she is because her father ditched her and then she conjured Pretzel Jack for real. And now, whether Pretzel Jack is present or not, she still walks around with like the scars of that situation yeah. with her dad. And th- I find that kind of stuff, th- those little details so powerful when they come through so strongly like that. Mm-hmm. And, the, and he kissed his sister, which is extra creepy, you know? 
<laughs> Never forget kissing your sister. I mean, at that point in the show, I wouldn't. I was not surprised because I kept reading it that way originally before they did the brother sister reveal. I was like, yeah. is he hitting on her? He's hitting on oh, her. Oh, he was way hitting. Yeah, on he her. was hitting on her. Yeah, and then they reveal that he is the brother, and I'm like, oh, maybe he just wants to. Maybe he just wants a sister again. Oh no. Uh, no, no. <laughs> he 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 did that he wants a sister and then some tall boy creeped me out too yes tall boy was really unsettling it was also the perfect time to bring tall boy into the picture Mm -hmm. when i mean now now that i think about the progression of that because pretzel jack doesn't become like oh pretzel jack until he comes back and tall boy enters the picture in pretzel jack's absence so it's just like super evil pretzel jack that goes stabby on everybody then all of a sudden you have an even more vicious tall boy but then pretzel jack comes back and he could still win you over yeah i love pretzel jack yeah i think we we all have that now i (laughs) I want like a pretzel jack plushie doll i i would want that I want I want all, all the pretzel jack things. I want Mondo art. I want plushies. Well, I want sheets and blankets. Why isn't Funko digging oh, in on my this? Goodness. But really, could you imagine um you could have pretzel jack, you could have the tooth monster. Yeah. I don't know what else what you could have from from no like maybe just the house because they make Rick settings. Hauer. They make yeah. <laughs> I, I would have him. I would have a Rucker Hauer. Um, it was nice seeing Barbara Cram- Crampton in this, even though she yes, was only in it she briefly. Was but barely like, in it. She was barely in it. But for someone who's barely in it and only gets so much screen time, she was like a little powerhouse in those moments. I liked it. It was a weird character. It is. <laughs> it was. It was really weird. I didn't know quite what to make of it. I thought it. that was going to go a totally different way with like the spying. Oh, so and did the, I. <laughs> nope, you're dead. That. And while I was watching him, like, laying in the little pool thing, I'm like, that's really nice. I should try that. And all of a sudden, he wakes up and sees Pretzel Jack. I'm yeah. like, I'm never trying that ever. I really ever. do want to try that. I hear it's great. And What's it called again? I don't, like, I don't know, floating pods. I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> floating pods. I think I that's like, a scientific term. I feel like my sister has done that. Or it's like, it's either the, the like, the floaty thing in the yeah. water or it's. Like cryo freezing stuff. I've never. Or, yeah, is I've that never, is that's a real thing? I didn't just that make is, that, that up. Is. That I'm not as interested in. But there's also like the sensory deprivation chambers mm-hmm. where you're floating in the water. Oh, and that I'm very interested in because it's just you and darkness and quiet, and it's supposed to be very therapeutic. Also, sounds like the perfect place for a horror movie to start. Oh, totally. I mean, well, like Stranger Things kind of worked with that, right? With no, Eleven in the first season. That is true. Yeah. Maybe I'm going to find out my powers when I go to a sensory <laughs> deprivation chamber. Oh, yeah. I kind of want the power to be able to conjure a dream door now. That would be great, but terrifying. Also, she killed like so many people she didn't know, need to kill. Oh, I know. That's it's kind of know, a bummer. <laughs> that's the bummer of it all. Yeah. Pretzel Jack's cute, but he is also super murdery. Yeah. I, and it was just like this constant battle in my head where, he, where I'm like, he's super murdery and bad, but if she could. If she could train Harness him, that. if she could train him, he's essentially like a guard dog. I don't, you know what I really like about this is that I would love, and I know it will never happen, but I am desperately and genuinely curious about the rest of her story. Like, what happens in her life when she learns to control this gift? Yeah. How many babies does she accidentally make? Like, what happens to this woman? No, that there are a lot of questions. I'm also thinking about... Because like, it seemed like Ian was deteriorating. Yes. So I, I also was busy wondering towards the end, what's max capacity? At what point do you start to waste away the more you conjure? We we did see that he had set up so many yeah, doors yeah. that, like, I think she's pretty far away from that. But that was, I mean, that's a lot of doors. I wonder if you have, like, Mac, like you can only do 100 doors and then you explode <laughs> or something. That's that's. I a mean, lot. he did he did make like fifteen puppies. How many puppies did he make? Oh, they were so cute. I know they they were kind of <laughs> cute, but they were eating a body. I know, and then that's they were not, a little less cute. It's not their fault. Ay, it was so disturbing too when he goes into Ian's basement and he's just open up all those. Like, why why did he save it? Why don't you just burn it? Because he's a fucking weirdo. He is Perry. a fucking weirdo. <laughs> he he's a, a fucking weirdo that looks like kisser. he makes great breakfast. All right, he can I will tell you, I wanted sp- that plate of eggs so <laughs> badly. Well, I want one of his dogs. So, like, what does that make <laughs> so me? So we're fine. We're going to yeah. live happily ever after with Wait, Ian. So did they just, like, their dog just go poof at the end? I guess it must have. It had to have yeah. because doesn't everything Aww. he created? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Poor baby. Oh, and it's not the dog's fault. No, that's what I'm I was surprised. Just saying. I'm surprised the dog doesn't have 
Like, like, why didn't the dog? They should have had the dog kill a bird or something. <laughs> because why doesn't the dog kill? Right. Because doesn't everything that come out of the dr- out of the door have a drive to kill? I don't know. That's an interesting question. Did that did that baby sack want to kill things? <laughs> I don't think the baby sack could kill anything if it wanted to. No, it could barely wiggle. I feel bad about laughing about a baby sack. <laughs> it was weird, man. It's kind it, of funny. It's it kind really, of sad. It really was. It, it, no, that was weird. That, I, I'll never forget that. That is, that's right up there with some of the Suspiria imagery where it's oh, yeah? just burned in my brain <laughs> for a very, very long time. It's definitely upsetting. I yeah. Those ideas, man, and, and Tosca's got ideas. See, but this, this I think, reflects the beauty of one creepy pasta and two Channel Zero is these are shows, these are seasons that suck you in to the fullest extent because all four of them are super, super atmospheric, and they also, pardon the pun, open the door up to so many Ooh. possibilities where you want to continue and you want to think about it and you want to think, what would I do in that situation? And yeah. you want to think, oh, what like what could life be like after for her in particular? But really, every single season has gotten stuck in my brain. And it that's is a, the power of smart horror storytelling. Yeah, it is. it does have that quality. And they do linger. Like I was saying, I want to know more about her story. I think if I... I would just drown in kittens and puppies if I had a dream door. Like, you'd... local woman dies <laughs> under the weight of 400 cats. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I would bet on that for you. Yeah. Um, you would just have Deweys. You'd have Deweys. 400 like a, a Deweys. Deweys. <laughs> well, I, ne- I never had an imaginary friend as a kid. Does that make me like a lame, not very imaginative child? I don't think so. I, I consider myself pretty darn imaginative. Like, I used I to don't. draw. Yeah, I don't know that I ever had an imaginary friend. If I did, I forgot about them. Sorry, dude. You know, I always... <laughs> this is what would come out of my dream. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I feel bad for anybody listening to the podcast right now. They can't see tears forming in my eyes. <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to be like a semi-okay artist, but whenever I drew, like, figures, I oh. couldn't. I couldn't draw, like... <clears throat> like the bodies or like the shape around the head like it couldn't draw the <laughs> and they would just be like floating eyes yes. and nose and mouth with like hair so it's like if something <laughs> came out of the dream door like that it would just be a floating head probably pretty like, horrifying not even a floating head but a floating just a face, face. <laughs> That sounds really scary, Perry. I feel like I need to draw this. Like, I vividly remember what this face yeah. looks like. I should draw it and make sure everybody can see it for their nightmares. I guess if it was based on what I would draw as a kid, something would come out of the door with two very mismatched sides of their face. Because I could never, I'd start one and it'd look great, and I could never get the other side to match. <laughs> Oh, man. I knew this was going to happen. I think this is only my second time coughing. You're doing great. You haven't had to leave the room. I had to leave the room. (laughs) But you left me with Lynn Shea, so it was fine. It was actually a a gift to you (laughs) as your friend. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh. What haven't we hit? In, what haven't we hit in Dream Door? In Dream Door, I feel I'm like afraid to like come close to wrapping this up because there's so much. It's I want to so like look fun. at all the pictures and stuff right now. Um, I you know, there's really very limited criticism for me on this show, and it's just <coughs> love. I'm even just looking through the cast list for previous seasons. It's like their so casting good. is a plus. It is across the board. Always. I can't think of a single lies. I thought of one. Not a not a weak link per se, but one character that felt like a little wooden and stale to mm. me. And I think it was because I love Dream Door so much. Um it was the, the the boyfriend character. I only know his real name and I feel bad saying his real name and throwing it on him under the bus. The but the boyfriend character in Dream Door? Yeah, the one who Jeff Ward plays. Now now his name is escaping me, but I think that was like one of the only where not where it had anything to do with performance but it just uh-huh. felt like a little bit of a bland character for the most part do you know who i'm talking about yeah sorry so n- like the one not... that's that's hitting on uh amy Forsythe the entire time kind of right yeah so not dream door did i say dream door yeah i meant no end house okay yeah i no, meant no end house. i can see Seth. that yeah set this is the same yeah um 
Yeah. I also think it's because No End House was filled with a whole bunch of like powerhouse characters uh-huh. and performances, and he just kind of felt a little vanilla to me. <laughs> I could see that. Absolutely. I really. I mean, some of the actresses they get, like Fiona Shaw, is one of my favorite she all-time is something actresses else. ever. Understandable. Um, there's this like a little theater nerd trivia about me. She did a performance of Hedda Gobbler once, and Hedda Gobbler is my favorite play, and I've seen countless renderings of that character, but I've never seen anybody play it like Fiona Shaw did. That does not surprise me and one bit. It's impossible to like find that performance, or at least it was ten years ago. Yeah. So I feel like I have this secret gift inside of me that like my my theater teacher had a VHS tape of it. She's amazing. I like that. And then they had, you know, Krisha Fairchild last year. Yeah, was she was great. Such a presence. I thought um all of them were great. Uh Holland Holland Roden yes. and uh, Olivia Lucardi? Was that her mm-hmm. name? Last name? I thought the three of them were great together. And they just wa- were. watching the two sisters in particular kind of like ping pong back and forth, it, mm-hmm. that was a very interesting duo to track. They were. And we just love this show. It really, yeah. I, I just I want to know what else I can do to keep it going. I know. I think this is the most panicked I've been in a very <laughs> long time about a show that I love not continuing because, I mean, really, Creepy Pasta is, is an endless mound of material to explore yeah. this could keep going don't stop it i know hopefully don't stop it hopefully their their ratings gambit paid off i mean is there has it been reported i should have looked this up early no oh, I, I don't think i've seen anything yet i, just I feel like shutter they're... should get into the business of making their own stuff and they should just adopt channel zero I could totally see that happening. I mean, I wouldn't mind. Shutter's doing originals. I think they did move into production. Did they? Yeah. It would be nice to see that happen. Yeah, I'm not seeing any any uh, news on the ratings here, which is too bad. I'd like to know that. Uh, hopefully, yeah, Shutter. Get on it. See, Take this is up. this is like a lifelong problem I have where whenever I have a good thing, I can never just enjoy the good thing and be happy I have it. I always have to be sad when it's over. Oh my god, I spent <laughs> I'm already like messing with my brain with Channel Zero in that it? same sense. I understand I mean not to get too deep and dark into Haley's fucked up little brain, but like I love hearing about that fucked up little no, brain. No, you don't. <laughs> Like, literally, I've spent my whole life afraid that the people I love are going to die. Like, that's how I perceive a, everything. That's a very human response to everything as in life. As soon as I, my father I'd passed surpri- away as a kid, I I'd just never... I'd be surprised never... if everybody out there didn't have at least a fraction of that in their I minds. I think about it all the time. I'll be like, what a lovely time I'm having with this person. When are they going to die? <laughs> um, yeah, I can't say that I'm any other way but that. Yeah. I mean, it's... So I understand, you know, thinking the nat- about the bad, even though you're in the good. It's the nature of life. I, yeah. I feel like that makes you appreciate the good even more. Hopefully. Yeah. Or does it poison your good with, with already experiencing oh, the bad? Oh, that's such a sinister spin on it. Ah, I'm going to pretend that I'm still You're hope- silver lining them all clouds. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> I have to try. I have oh, to try with so every day with all like, the, the doom and gloom out I there. Know. If I If I got to hold tight to certain things, I'm going to. And right now I'm holding tight to my love for Channel Zero. I need to go back and rewatch episodes one and two because I want to. I also want to see if I if I completely misread the whole cheating on her thing. I'm <laughs> curious. Well, because also I did think of this. She I'm sure says, someone in the comments will explain it. Oh, they'll <laughs> tell you how wrong you were. Count Probably. on it. <laughs> you can count on the internet for that. Uh, uh, but she does say, like, when they're having an argument, she's like, "This moved way too fast." Mm-hmm. So I think they got married very quickly. I see. I see. Um, supporting my case. All right. He's innocent. No, I'm fully. Not really. I'm full well ready to admit <laughs> whenever I'm wrong. He's pretty guilty. But. <laughs> well, yeah, that too. Yeah. Um, before we wrap this up, any final thoughts on Channel Zero or uh, Dream Door in particular? Watch it. Watch all of it. Tweet about it. Tell your friends. Tell your parents. Tell your loved ones. Tell your cat. If they can watch TV on their own. If they count as a subscriber. Yeah, if they have a Nielsen box in their (laughs) room, tell your cat. Make sure your cat watches. Yeah. Um, I want to echo all that. This this show is so good. It deserves to be around. Don't let it go anywhere. It already happened once this year with my love for Ash vs. Evil Dead. Don't do it again. Support good horror productions. Just tattoo that. 
<laughs> Maybe that's your don't next tell me. <laughs> don't tell me to do that because I might just do that. Um, before we wrap up this episode, though, I really like that we did this last week. Have you had any new horror goodness in your life that you want to share with everybody? Oh, new horror goodness. New horror goodness. You know, goodness gracious, I've been sort of reveling in the freedom of not working horror all day every day in October. <laughs> you, you worked so damn hard on Collider.com in all of October. Well, thank you very much. So much content. Thank you. Yeah, so much thoughtful, passionate content. Well, you know what? It, if, if people want to pay attention to horror one month a year, I'm going to give it to them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so while well, Channel Zero has obviously been a light of my life, as we just said, um, I was revisiting... The Haunting of Hill House over the weekend, watching some of my favorite episodes hmm. from that, which I have a lot of interesting thoughts on the second time around. And Ooh. it's it's a different show the second time around because you're not as scared and you're not crying all the time. Better or different? I'm cute. Ooh, yeah. I want to hear, hear more about we'll, that. We'll talk about this. Okay. But it okay. is it felt really different, not to say that it's not still brilliant, but I just was like, Wow, what a completely, completely different experience yeah. than your first time around. Okay. Um, I don't want to give like not a good answer. But <laughs> I don't know that I have one. I, I've got I've got yeah. a, one thing in my back pocket. So I mean everybody well <coughs> oh no, three. Everyone uh, well knows that, that I listen to a whole lot of uh, Stephen King audiobooks. Yes. And I recently finished Cujo and Cujo Cujo got me oh. in the heart. And it, it's such, I haven't revisited the movie in forever. I think maybe I've seen it like once or twice in my life and I barely remember it. So I don't, I don't even remember if this is present at all in the movie. But one of the things about the book that really got in my brain is that he puts you in Cujo's position every so often. Mm. And just to, to under, like, not not really spell out the confusion that a dog is feeling when, when, a, when, a, when rabies is attacking his body. Sure. But, but yeah, the... The safety, the warmth, and the love, and the happiness he has in his everyday life, and to see to see and feel that deteriorating, oh, it just oh. ripped my heart into pieces. But I finished Cujo, and then uh, Jeff Snyder gave me his book of the dark half. He keeps insisting that I read it, and I, I think I'm like maybe a third of the way through, but it just got super murdery, and it's <laughs> that is a violent, violent book. Yes, it is. Oh God, he <laughs> he paints pictures of like the most brutal kill sequences but i'm super into it <laughs> i like the dark half a lot that's a that's a good recommendation um i did think of something that i have not talked about on the Ooh. show and should have the curious creations of christine mcconnell on netflix is a hybrid cooking show slash puppet comedy that's all weird and gothy and horror-y and Christine McConnell is a phenomenal artist. She makes, uh, she bakes creepy creations and she got Instagram Ooh. famous for that. She Ooh. is incredible and it is the weirdest, most charming show. Oh it, my God. It has puppet work from Henson Alternative. Rose is a disaster. She's like this roadkill that's been reanimated. What are these creatures? They're amazing. They're amazing. There's like Rose, Wrinkle. That's Rose. Yes. Uh, huge recommend. There are only six episodes right now, which is oh, no. genuinely a tragedy. And these are Halloween themed kind of. I'm really Netflix. Listen to me. Listen to my words. Make it for Christmas. Make it for oh, everything. <gasps> Thanksgiving, Easter. Do it. This raccoon is talking. That's Rose. That's my girl. What is that? Haley, thank you. Yes. I don't even like cooking, but I need to watch These this. These are not things you could ever make anyway. That's part of the funny part of the show. She She's like, obviously, a few hours later, I ended up with this. And it's like a masterpiece. Is this her first series? Or yes. has she done other like cooking shows? Oh, my God. And she's got a weird vibe. She's not like a super polished, trained host. She's kind of really mellow and quiet, but it's very calming and... I, I love it. I might be downloading this. Yes. So I have a trip to uh, visit family in Florida coming up. So oh, cool. for that flight, I'm going to download the rest of Sabrina. Uh huh. And I'll put this on the iPad Do as well. It. This <gasps> is a delight. I'm super pumped. All right. That's it, guys. Now <laughs> you have. Uh, Hopefully you got the message and you're going to continue to spread the channel zero love. Yes. And now you got some other horror content to check out as well. 
Haley, until the next episode, where can everyone find you on the internet? You can find me on Collider.com, where I run the horror content. You can find me on Twitter at Haley Fouch, and you can find me on Instagram at Haystack McGroovy. And you can catch me on Twitter and Instagram, at PNMROF. On Instagram is where you could find that John Carpenter concert footage. If yes. you want to check it out, as always, thank you guys so much for listening, for the support, for sharing. We read your comments, and we really do love having we that love dialogue you. with you guys. So thank you for celebrating our favorite genre with us. You have officially survived the witching hour. Thank you.